product rule, right? So let's do derivative of this times that and then plus derivative of this times this. I'm splitting it, I'm splitting it right here for my product rule. Six y z plus a derivative of z is what? Partial z with respect to x times six x y. Okay, let me go back through that. This is a product because I have two variables, x and z, right? X. This is my dependent variable. This is my independent variable. So when I cover that up, I take derivative of this. Uh, 6 and y are constants, derivative of x is 1 with respect to x. So I get 6y, but then times z. So that's this. Then I'm going to take derivative of this with respect to x, which is partial z with respect to x, times the other side, 6xy. So that's our product rule, right? Equals? Zero. zero. And now what we would do is we would solve for this, right? We would get this and this together, like get those on one side. Let's do it. I want because I'm going to have a slightly shorter way to do this in a second. So I want us to get to the answer so we can compare it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this over here on the left side. I'm going to leave this on the left side and move everything else to the right side. So 3z squared partial z with respect to x plus partial z with respect to x 6xy equals negative 3x squared minus th uh, 6, sorry, minus 6yx, or yz, 6yz. <coughs> On the left side, what do we do? Factor. Factor out partial z with respect to x, and then divide through by what was remaining when we factored. So I think I can do this in one step. Hopefully you can follow me here. Partial z with respect to x is negative 3x squared minus 6yz over 3z squared plus 6xy. So for this particular equation, if I want to know how fast z is changing with respect to x, I have to fix y. And then this is the rate it's changing, which means not only do I have to fix the y, I then have to give you the x and the z coordinates for where you're interested in knowing the information. All right. We okay? All right. I'm going to try and do this problem a different way, but now I need to show you a little bit of theory. All right. Suppose, that's the symbol for suppose, we have an equation with x, y, and z. All right, three variables. Now this is a, what I'm about to give you is kind of a shortcut, but it only really works, the, the formula that I'm giving you is only going to work if we've got x, y, z. If we had more than x, y, z, if we had four variables, the, this formula won't work anymore. But a lot of times, especially since we were working with surfaces, right, you have z, x, and y. So this, this is applicable to a lot of things that we're going to do. All right, so we have some equation uh, that has x, y, and z in it. The example, I'll just write it to the side, the one we just used, right? x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed plus 6 x, y, z equals 1, right? That's an example of an equation that has three, those three variables in it. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to move everything to one side. If we move all terms to, let's say, left side, we have something that looks like this some capital F, some function of x, y, and z equals zero. 
So let me show you that over here. I'm going to move everything to one side. This right here is capital F. It is some function that takes as its input x, y, and z, and then spits out outputs, right? What we're really looking at is when is this function zero, right? That's what this equation says. So I've come up and I've just called this left side capital F, right? I'm just calling it capital F. Now, <clears throat> let's do one, let's try and come up with a tree for this capital F. Let's try and come up with a tree. All right, so this was just to kind of, so we could see that what we're doing with the problem that we just had, but I really want to focus on that, that theoretical approach right now. If I created a tree, the top of my tree is capital F. F depends on what? X, Y, and Z. What derivatives are possible? So this is where things get this is where things get a little bit tricky here. What derivatives are possible at this point? Partial of f with respect to x, partial of f with respect to y, partial of f with respect to z. That's what's possible now, right? But I'm going to add one more huge condition onto this. All right, one huge condition. Now suppose that z is some function of x and y. Now, the reason I threw that, that on here is because we are working with surfaces, right? Surfaces are where z is determined. You give me an x and a y, you plug it in, it spits out something on the surface, right? So let's assume here, let's suppose that the z depends on just x and y, then I could write this, couldn't I? Yes. All right. Now I'm going to write something else that's going to look really weird, but I'm going to write it. Do you agree with that? X depends on itself, right? Now this is the part that is going to look strange. Now, just look at that for a moment. I hope that you agree that z depends on x and y because I told us, hey, suppose it does, right? I hope everyone agrees that x depends on itself and that y would depend on itself, right? Wouldn't those create partial, uh, partial uh, derivatives? Wouldn't they create partials? Um, that's yeah. what we're going to talk about now. They like, would they? So uh, you should have a little bit of a problem with this right here. This should look a little weird to you, right? This should look a little weird. Because how does x depend on y and how does y depend on x? So I'm going to try and, try and illustrate this with a simpler example. I, I want to keep this up here, but I'm going to need to erase it. Let's go back to Cal 1 real fast. When we write down y equals, let's go with sine x. I think we all agree with this picture. We all agree with that? Yes? Now, would it be incorrect for me to write this? It makes sense? Because, look, y depends on x, yes but y depends on itself. There is no y in here, right? But you can almost visualize like there is a y. If I put a y in there like that, like zero y, then it does depend on itself, but it's not really there. It's kind of like I'm adding this in here just because I want to get the branches to all look the same. But it doesn't change what's going on here. This one right here is what's forcing me to add these two. That z depends on x and y. Yeah, does that help a little bit or no? 
All right, so let's just take this on faith for right now. I guess I'm going to have to let you take it on faith for now. If we, if we can draw this without any sort of problems in your brain, give me the parts of the branches, the partials. What do we have? Partial F. Partial F. Uh, I don't know why I put Z, because I probably do Z a lot. OK, partial capital F with respect to X, capital F with respect to Y. Partial X with respect to X, partial X with respect to Y. Partial Y with respect to X, partial Y with respect to Y. Partial Z with respect to X, partial Z with respect to Y. Oh, I missed the middle one, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I totally messed this up. This is Z, sorry, partial capital F with respect to Y. Ooh. So what derivatives are possible here? You could have partial F with respect to X or a partial F with respect to Y. Okay. Yes, I agree with the tree and all that. Those are the possible derivatives. But getting back to last class, when we had that z was a function, z was a function of x and y, when we had that, what were the two things we were interested in? It helped us when we were doing our tangent plane. What were the two derivatives that made the most sense to us? Partial of what? Z with respect to x and partial of z with respect to y. Those are the ones that, that meant the most to us in last class, right? Those are the ones that meant the most? Do you all see those in this table? Partial z with respect to x. See it right here? Partial z with respect to y, you see it right here? They're in this table, aren't they? They're in this table. Now, I'm going to do something. What if I wanted to know, um, let's go after this one right here. What if I wanted to know what this one was? How could I come up with some equation, some formula that would, that would have this in it? So remember what we started with. We started with capital F of x, y, z equals 0. Do you remember that? That's what we started with. And then we drew the tree from that. Here's our tree. And I'm interested in trying to find a formula for this. So why don't we find the partial of f with respect to x? What would that be? What's well, the partial of f? If we take the, this right here and we take the partial of f with respect to x, I'm going to do something to this, right? Take the partial of this with respect to x. What does the partial of, of this side with respect to x become? Zero, right? So shouldn't we have that equation hold true? Now, we have to write out the partial of capital F with respect to x. We have to go down the branches. So what branches are we going down? All these, right? Here, here, and here. Those three. And we multiply and add, don't we? So left side of this equation becomes partial of capital F with respect to x times partial what x with respect to x. What do you think that is? 1 plus, all right, partial of f with respect to y times partial y with respect to x plus partial f with respect to z times partial z, uh, yeah, with respect to x. That must be 0. You all buy that? What am I trying to solve for? You see it in there? This one right here? That's what I'm trying to, uh, where did I put it? Where did I, oh, here, right? Isn't that the one we're going after? 
All right, let's solve for it algebraically. Let's solve for it algebraically. I know this all looks crazy, but at the end I'm going to get to a formula. If you just are waiting for the formula, it's coming. Just trying to show you where it comes from. All right, so how about partial f with respect to z times partial z with respect to x equals negative, negative partial f. f with respect to x. x. That's this one right here. Yeah. Moved over, and that's a 1, right? And then move that one over, so you have minus partial f, partial f partial with respect to partial y, partial y, partial y with respect to x. Can, can what cancel out? That, yep, that's what I, I was going to ask you that. But hold on, let's just keep going one more step, OK? One more step. So what would, what would we have here? Partial z with respect to x equals that whole thing. Yeah. Over partial f with respect to z. Here comes the last little tricky part because I know I know y'all want to cancel this, right? I know y'all really want to cancel this, like cancel the partials and make this become two of the same thing. I know you want to do that. But there's something vitally important that you understand here. What did this, what did this turn into and tell me why? One, right? And that's because you're saying, how much does x change by if I change x just a little bit, right? And that's always 1. The ratio is always 1 because it's the, the change over its own change, right? Yes? Couldn't you just multiply by the reciprocal? Hold on. Okay. Let me finish the thought. That's what that was, right? Yeah. Okay. This is the part that you'll need to figure out what it is and try and explain to me why it is that. Think back to this picture. We are assuming z is some function of x and y, right? That was that second thing I said we needed to suppose. If I look at the tree diagram for this, what would it look like? x, y, right? And what is this saying? How much does y change by if x changes a little bit? What are we assuming in this picture? Does y depend on x at all? It does not depend on x. Our second assumption was that z is a function of x and y, which means they're independent from one another. That if x changes a little bit, yes, that changes z, but x changing a little bit doesn't impact y at all. That means this should be what? Zero. Zero. A change in x has no impact on y. So this should zero out. And if this zeroes out, it's just this over this. That's a little tricky subtlety, but that's where we get our final formula from. Is that where you get negative z Well, here's our formula. Our formula is that the partial of z with respect to x is equal to negative partial of capital F with respect to x over partial of capital F with respect to z. That's it. This is the big one right here. Now, that took a long time to derive that formula, but there it is. Now, let's see if it works. Let's take the problem we had just a second ago. It was x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed plus 6xyz equals 1, right? So first thing I'm going to do is move the 1 over and make it equal 0. This left side, I'm going to call capital F. I would like us to find the partial of z with respect to x. 
This is the formula for it. We're asking ourselves, how much does Z change if we hold Y what? Constant. I think that might be another way you can see this right here, is that if we're holding Y constant, right, then what does this change got to be? How much does Y change if X changes? Well, Y is being held constant in this partial derivative, isn't it? So it doesn't change. They're independent of one another. So what is, the, what is the negative partial of f with respect to x? So look at this left side. Take the partial of this with respect to x and make it negative. So what's the derivative of that with respect to x? 3x squared. I'll put the negative out front. So 3x squared, partial of that with respect to x? Uh, with respect to x? Zero, right? We're treating everything like constants except x. All right? What is partial of that with respect to x? So plus 6yz. Okay, over, now, what's the partial of f with respect to z? 0, 0, 3z squared plus 6xy. And just go check back in your notes. Is that what we had earlier? That's it, right? So just you have to be careful on this because when you take derivative of f with respect to x, you're not treating z as if it depends on x. So that, that's why you didn't have that 3z squared part. This is implicit differentiation for three variable equations. Now there's another formula if you want to know the partial of z with respect to y. And that formula is very similar to that one. It's, as you might suspect, negative partial f with respect to y over partial f with respect to z. So there's only one slight little change in that. Do you all see it? With respect to y, with respect to x. And I want to give you another example. That one's no good. I mean, it's good, but we've already done it. Let's do another one. This will be our last example of the day. So what if we had we haven't used tangent, have we? Let's do tangent of x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus xy equals x, z squared. What's that? Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to tell you, hold on, don't do anything yet. Um, I'm going to go to Wolfram real quick and see if that graphs anything interesting. Tangent of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Make sure I got that right. What do I have? Plus x times y equals x times z squared. So Wolfram Alpha is going to go try and find all the, the order triples x, y, and z that satisfy that equation. And hopefully it'll graph the solution without making me have to get their pro version. Although it doesn't look like it's having a good time right now. Hmm. All right, I have a better idea. Desmos? I don't know if Desmos can handle this. It can't do. I don't think I can do an equation of three variables. Anyone use Desmos? Anybody have any um, good 3D graphing software that's free online? No? My computer's dead right now. The battery's dead or else I would do it online. Um, 
Let me just see what happens. Tangent x plus y plus z. No, it wants to do a slider. OK, I'm not, sorry, we're going to have to go without a picture. Can you handle that? I'll, I'll graph it. I'll graph it, and I'll, I'll show you the graph at the beginning of next class so you can at least see. So this is, if there, if there are any x, y's, and z's, if there are, that satisfy this equation, then we have some sort of surface. And we're saying if z somehow depends on, on x, then we know the rate at which z changes with respect to x. Or if z can be looked at as depending on y, hold x constant, then we can see that change by computing this. Right? So let's, let's try this. Let's do one of these. Let's do the first one there. Let's do this. So what do I have to do first before I begin? Move everything to one side. Okay, that'll be easy. I'm going to make that minus, make that equal zero, right? Everything on the left side now is capital F. The whole left side is capital F. So we're going to do negative, and then the partial of this with respect to x. It's negative natural log cosine x squared. What? Natural log. Deriva derivative tangent is secant oh, squared. Okay, so negative, let's go, secant squared <laughs> of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Then times derivative, what's inside with respect to x? So 2x. We're done with the tangent part, right? Plus derivative of, of this with respect to x, treating y like a constant, so just y plus derivative of this with respect to x, treating z like a constant. So my, uh, what is that? Minus z squared. And my parentheses, I can close it off now. All of that over the partial of that with respect to z. And when I do the partial of that with respect to z, I get secant squared again x squared plus y squared plus z squared, but then times derivative of the inside with respect to z, so 2z plus 0 for this, right? And then minus derivative of this with respect to z, 2xz. So it's just a power rule on z squared, and I don't need the parentheses. And that would be it. The only other way to get this derivative would be to solve that for z. Like take your first, your original equation and solve it for z. Isolate z by itself. And you can't do it algebraically. You cannot get the z trapped, or from being trapped inside that trig function. So that's our only choice. So if we're giving this on the exam, are we going to have to remember the formula? <sighs> yeah, I think that one's, I think, I think that's a pretty easy formula to remember. Right? It's not too complicated. When is your exam, your first exam, by the way? Next Wednesday? Is that what it is? I, I don't have the calendar with me right now. It's coming around the corner soon. Okay, 1 through 8, 17, 19 through 21, 25 through 28. That's the homework for this section. And we're, we're kind of done. I didn't, uh, I didn't have the handout to sign in today. Let me make sure I don't. Let me just double check. No, I don't. So yeah, the t who has the calendar? Let's verify that next, next Wednesday. Anyone have their calendar? It is the 11th. Is that a week from Wednesday? I think it is. So next Wednesday. So what, what should we do to prepare for that? Just do your homework, right? I mean, I really do promise you that the problem, problems on that home, um, exam will be, I'm just going to go like thumbing through the homework problems and just like picking problems. And, and it's not going to be the same exact problems. Well, there might be, but, you know, I'm, I'm just going to tweak it a little bit. I know there's a lot of problems, all right? And I'm sure you'd want for me to, nar for me to narrow it down, but, um, you know, just review. 
everything we've done. Now, I'm not going to give you a problem from every single section. I'm, I'm going to pick the things I think are important. Like, I probably won't have you calculate a cross product. But I might have you find the intersection of two planes, because then you have to do a cross product, right? So things like that. But I'll keep it within the, the scope of the homework. I won't go beyond that. It won't look like the mini exams. All right? You get to go early today, unless you all want to stay and continue to differentiate. <laughs> that, we've, that, we've early, that we've ended early? Like 15 minutes early. That's 10 minutes. Yeah.